Eric is here. Woo! And Hi, Eric. Put some light on your face there. <laughs> you are in the dark. Can you flip around? We'll see. Let me see. It's because it's the, the, the light through. One, one, one sec. Let's see. See, I'm directing my director. The guy <laughs> directed me to easily the single best performance that I've probably ever given in a film, especially a horror film. And I'm telling him how to light his. Well, <laughs> it's a real insight into how it probably was on set. I was going to say a lot of contribution. <laughs> No, on set, I will. I, I can't sing his praises enough because when, when I lucked into this movie, the only thing I knew is yes, it's a DJ, yes, it's rock and roll, but it's not really rock and roll. It's metalcore, and this is not a woman in her twenties who wants to give up playing headbanging music and do something serious. This is a woman who's given her life to this music and this radio station, and this is her identity. I did not want to be Caroline. I didn't want to give the audience Carolineisms. I didn't want that. And I told Eric, I said, if you, wherever you can take me, take me. I will go where you want me to go. And he was right there. I mean, he was, his face was right by the lens or his, he was right on the monitor. And he talked me through most of the major and big moments in the movie. And that's the reason that it's good. That's that's why a director is essential to a film. <laughs> it was such a trip as well. We um, we reviewed it again last night because some of the some of the other guys haven't seen it yet, and uh, everyone had so much fun. Like it's the perfect place in the north of England to watch this movie because we have downpours and so much rain all the time. So all we could hear when we were watching this movie is just like the rain hitting the roof. It kind of set the atmosphere for the whole film. Like everyone was fixed for like an hour and a half. It was great. Oh, and I, I hope, I hope, I hope they liked it. Loved it. I'm glad you. Oh. Noticed, I'm glad you noticed the rain because it's such like a thing that I think most people are just only subconsciously aware of when they watch the movie, which is good. It's what it's supposed to be, but it was like such such a big thing because I mean, we had a very small crew and. I just, they knew we needed rain, so they just made a rain machine one day, and they sent me a test video, and I was like, oh, cool. And so it was just about finding, I mean, we'd know where they were, but like hooking, moving, because we only had one, so we had to like move it window to window. We were moving sets in the middle of the night and like find where to plug the hose in, and sometimes the building is old, so like floors were flooding, and we were, so. <laughs> it's such a question. crucial thing though, because when you hear that rain, you kind of focus and you feel like you're in the movie and then you forget you're watching a movie and you're just there. It kind of yeah. uh, sets the scene. It's cocooning. Yes, the rain definitely. and storms, you feel cocooned and safe in your place. And of course the paradox of the whole film, the contradiction of the whole film is she is not safe and no one is safe. And it's, it's pretty amazing. Guys, 10 minutes to midnight. How would you summarize it for people who, uh, maybe going to buy a ticket, have already bought a ticket. Um, how would you summarize the film? Uh, I always say it's like a Twilight Zone, Stephen King kind of hybrid, but the real inspiration, at least the seed of it, came from this idea of wanting to emulate some kind of extended episode of a forgotten late night horror anthology show. Um, wanted to help people recapture the feeling of flipping through channels and being up a little bit too late and maybe stumbling on something that you're just slightly too young to watch, but being very into it anyway. So that, that's, that's the seed of it. And what I would say is it's a movie with a very unusual emotional life. You think you're going into a horror movie, but you're going on a very unusual, almost David Lynch style emotional journey that's gonna take you into some very surprising places that you absolutely have no idea exist in most horror films. A couple of people have like brought up like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind of this movie, which was like never on the brain, but it's like such a cool thing to compare it to because it's sort of, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I, I would never try to you know, say that this movie is that, but I, I think that um, it does become, cerebral and sentimental in a way that you might not be expecting given how like weird and nihilistic it is at other parts. So. 
I think it's a, it's a perfect movie for the times as well that we're in at the moment. That kind of uh, the whole claustrophobia and and being trapped as well and inside yeah. the radio, like it couldn't have come out at a more perfect time. That's gonna be. I mean, that's that that should be our new marketing thing, right? Like stuck inside. Not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Trapped. Trapped. Yeah, no, I th- I thought. What going back to the claustrophobia thing? I thought that it was actually quite an interesting molding of a film with how you've done that. Because sometimes films when really claustrophobic, like you've got typical like cave films like The Descent and everything. But even though it is quite sometimes that like small hallways, it's a generally large setting, but you feel so like trapped and tight and all the time. And I think that's due to how the emotional storyline with Amy plays out. Mm-hmm. Totally. I mean, we we we, we did our best to differentiate these scenes because it is a very small space and I think that came with um, allowing the runtime to be what it was and and tracking emotional beats. I mean, Caroline and I just spent a lot of time just like figuring out where she was in the last scene and where she was going in the next scene so that nothing ever felt redundant, that even if we were in a similar space, what, what the experience was in that space was different. And how did it feel to get back in the kind of the radio chair, because obviously most people may know you a stretch from from Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. Did it did it feel weird? Did it feel like you had that kind of talent ready to go again? It was such an extraordinarily different experience, and that was largely due number one Carson Bloomquist, who wrote the script and developed it with his brother Eric, um, and Eric's direction. Because I never felt it's very meta on the one hand. But Amy's experience is so entirely different from Stretch that most of the fans who have contacted me said, I didn't think about Chainsaw 2 for a minute. I mean, I look very different. I, I believe I sounded very different. Um, the two women are so extraordinarily different. And that was one of the things that I told Eric going in. I said, I do not want reminiscences of Stretch. I do not want Texas there. I do not, and and I love my home state. I really do. I can't wait to get back. But next week. (laughs) I, um, I, I, um, I I want this, I, I want this character and the environment to be completely different for the viewer. I want it to resonate on its own. And I really think that was successful. And a lot of that credit also goes to Thomas Wynn. Um, His photography, the the way he composed his shots, the way he put the actors in the frame, um, really unique, really interesting. I think it was, uh, as well as being an amazing horror film as well, there were so many kind of deeper qualities to Amy's character as well. You know, just taking all the kind of chaos that ensues out of the question, you know, having that last ever radio show is such an interesting concept. And, you know, that character and the way she's dealing with and processing that kind of mm-hmm. part of her life and the, the ending of her life really in, in one way is, is right. really we were, it, it was really interesting because in the development of it, we knew the radio thing, we knew the vampire thing, we knew the older DJ thing, the live show thing, but I, we were looking for a location. And one of the places that I toured was an actual radio station that it, um, had been around for a long time. They were now affiliated with a college campus and they were going under and they'd been told three months before that this was their last three months. And I walked in and everyone was so generous and so kind and, and giving me a tour and giving me their insight. And they and I told them sort of the basic premise for the movie, and they said, and, and I said, wow, I mean, I mean, it must suck knowing that this is it. I mean, three months and that's it. And they're like, no, this is. I mean, in radio, I mean, it's very, very sad. But in radio, you often even don't know when it's your last show. You're just handed a box when you're done. And I and they said, you're hired to get in radio. You're hired to get fired. And I was like, bingo, that's a line in the movie, and that's a premise for the movie. And what if that is the inciting incident? I mean, it is your last show, and you don't even know it, and and you just sort of find out while it's happening. And what is that? what does that do? And we didn't even end up shooting there, but it was like sort of the crux for the inciting incident of the movie was that tour. And I really hope that these guys get a chance to see it because it is, I don't know, it's, there's just something so, it, it lights a spark, but it also just feels so inconsequential. You're just handed a box after 30 years and that's it. And, and that, that felt dramatic 
to me and it felt like everything could sort of that could be the linchpin for a lot of it i think it'll um it'll resonate with a lot of people at the moment as well obviously without mentioning kind of covid again but there is a lot of bad things happening to people and people having their kind of lives ripped from under them and and you know mm -hmm. kind of losing their jobs and all sorts so again it, it resonated with me on on quite a higher kind of you know a higher level when i was watching it just with everything that's going on at the moment which obviously may or may not have been intentional i mean i certainly didn't know COVID was coming down the pike but i think maybe that i mean there, there's a little bit of fortuitous not fortuitousness that we have COVID, but just like that there yeah. is this extra layer of something um but also i think that might just speak to the palpability of these themes and how there is sort of a transferability there depending on, on what situation you're in of feeling trapped and how that can manifest itself in different ways and you know that's that's that was our goal at the end of the day was to tell a story about a central horror um with all the loving genre touches but to have this central horror of relevance or lack thereof and it being an on-off switch yeah i think the um in line with that, the whole um, side of the film that's very emotive based and the whole, you're like hired to get fired. I feel like it's almost like Amy is aware of this. She's a very strong headed character, but at the same time, it's still such a surprise with how long she's been there. And I feel what that really helps play out is this whole perspective of the film. We are with Amy, obviously she's our lead character. And then at the same time, some of the things she does can be questionable. You don't really trust her, her judgment because you are seeing it as her, but it's sort of this mix of perspectives. What, who are we looking on? Who can we believe? Is it a dream? Is she going to wake up any minute? Is, is it real? I really like that throughout. Mm -hmm. Totally. Exactly. I mean, uh, you know, Amy's not only deconstructing in her, you know, professionally, she's deconstructing mentally and physically and assimilating those changes and showing those to the audience you know is is what the movie is about and how those things manifest and um she is no longer in control and she's used to being in control of her world you know and uh referring to the COVID thing um things are a little out of control you know uh the fear is just it's extraordinary i mean it, there and I was at the mall the other day with my son. It was empty. There was no one there. A couple of shop owners said, "Yeah, we've been closed down twice. We've reopened twice. It could happen again tomorrow." The absolute lack of predictability and reliability of the normal functions of your life, the ordinary functions of your life. Um, you know, there's this. I mean, like to your point about getting getting fired i mean it's it's we all know we're gonna die one day or we all know to a lesser extent like we're gonna graduate from high school we're gonna whatever we all know it's gonna happen we don't really fully internalize it until almost after it's happened because when it happens it's almost inconsequential and after it happens you realize it's gone um there's this line in the movie it feels like forever when you're in the middle but by the time you get there it's just you know right. that's, that's that's what that feeling is we just sort of whether it's a defense mechanism, whether it's, I, I, I don't know, but I, I think that there's, there's beauty in that, that you can just be in the present, but, but you can sort of take it for granted too and get lost in it. And, and or I, I don't think it's more question than an answer, but it's just something that we, we meditate on with this movie too, which perhaps some people aren't expecting. And I think a lot of people like that, but obviously some people get frustrated by that when they see that in this movie, but like, thanks for watching, you know? <laughs> You know, and, and one of the things that I loved so much about the script and loved about Eric as we talked our way through it, they've got a le Eric and Carson have a level of sophistication that I didn't expect in young men. And I see, a, I, I see scripts from, from younger women and they tend to be very nuclear family, very mom, you know, the way a woman my age is envisioned. It, it, has, has I, it's just seemed restrictive to me and that wasn't present in this script and as Eric you know I have lived the life of being in the middle and the middle lasts forever I've been a wife I've been a mother dedicating yourself to marriage and family life 
uh, or 